this could not be accounted for in the steady state theory, though Hoyle and Nerlicker tried desperately. It was just as well I hadn't been a student of Hoyle, because I would have had to have defended the steady state. The microwave background indicated that the universe had had a hot, dense stage in the past. But it didn't prove that was the beginning of the universe. One might imagine that the universe had had a previous contracting phase and that it had bounced from contraction to expansion at a high but finite density. This was clearly a fundamental question, and it was just what I needed to complete my PhD thesis. Gravity pulls matter together, but rotation throws it apart. So my first question was, could rotation cause the universe to bounce? Together with George Ellis, I was able to show that the answer was no, if the universe was spatially homogeneous, that is, if it was the same at each point of space. However, two Russians, Lifshitz and Kolatnikov, had claimed to have proved that a general contraction without exact symmetry would always lead to a bounce with the density remaining finite. This result was very convenient for Marxist-Leninist dialectical materialism because it avoided awkward questions about the creation of the universe. It therefore became an article of faith for Soviet scientists. Lifshitz and Kolatnikov were members of the old school in general relativity. That is, they wrote down a massive system of equations and tried to guess a solution. But it wasn't clear that the solution they found was the most general one. However, Roger Penrose introduced a new approach which didn't require solving the field equations explicitly, just certain general properties of nature, such as that energy is positive and gravity is attractive. Penrose gave a seminar in King's College, London, in January 1965. I wasn't at the seminar, but I heard about it from Brandon Carter, with whom I shared an office in the then new DAMTP premises in Silver Street. At first, I couldn't understand what the point was. Penrose had showed that once a dying star had contracted to a certain radius, there would inevitably be a singularity, a point where space and time came to an end. Surely, I thought, we already knew that nothing could prevent a massive cold star collapsing under its own gravity until it reached a singularity of infinite density. But in fact, the equations had been solved only for the collapse of a perfectly spherical star. Of course, a real star won't be exactly spherical. If Lifshitz and Kolatnikov were right, the departures from spherical symmetry would grow as the star collapsed and would cause different parts of the star to miss each other and avoid a singularity of infinite density. But Penrose showed they were wrong. Small departures from spherical symmetry will not prevent a singularity. I realized that similar arguments could be applied to the expansion of the universe. In 
this case, I could prove there were singularities where space-time had a beginning. So again, Lifshitz and Kalanika were wrong. General relativity predicted that the universe should have a beginning, a result that did not pass unnoticed by the church. In the next five years, Roger Penrose, Bob Sherich, and I developed the theory of causal structure, that is, cause and effect, in general relativity. It was a glorious feeling, having a whole field virtually to ourselves. How unlike particle physics, where people were falling over themselves to latch on to the latest idea. They still are. <laughs> Up to 1970, my main interest was in the Big Bang singularity of cosmology, rather than the singularities that Penrose had shown would occur in collapsing stars. However, in 1967, Werner Israel produced an important result. He showed that unless a remnant from a collapsing star was exactly spherical, the singularity it contained would be naked, that is, it would be visible to outside observers. This would have meant that the breakdown of general relativity at the singularity of a collapsing star would destroy our ability to predict the future of the rest of the universe. At first, most people, including Israel himself, thought that this implied that because real stars aren't spherical, their collapse would give rise to naked singularities and breakdown of predictability. However, a different interpretation was put forward by Roger Penrose and John Wheeler. It was that there is cosmic censorship. This says that nature is a prude and hides singularities in black holes where they can't be seen. I used to have a bumper sticker Black holes are out of sight, on the door of my office in DAMTP. This so irritated the head of department, that he engineered my election to the location professorship, moved me to a better office on the strength of it, and personally tore off the offending notice from the old office. My work on black holes began with a eureka moment in 1970, a few days after the birth of my daughter, Lucy. While getting into bed, I realized that I could apply to black holes the causal structure theory I had developed for singularity theorems. In particular, the area of the horizon, the boundary of the black hole, would always increase. When two black holes collide and merge, the area of the final black hole is greater than the sum of the areas of the original holes. This, and other properties that Jim Bardeen, Brandon Carter, and I discovered, suggested that the area was like the entropy of a black hole. This would be a measure of how many states a black hole could have on the inside, for the same appearance on the outside, like the many possible states of the air molecules inside a given balloon. But the area couldn't actually be the entropy, because as everyone knew, Black holes were completely black and couldn't be in equilibrium with thermal radiation. <laughs> 